In this video, I'll show you through the actual first ever purpose-built aircraft for the US President. I'll show you where Franklin D. Roosevelt sat, his oversized bulletproof window, the wheelchair lift, and tell you about this plane's secret Soviet holiday in 1945. I'm Paul Stewart, and I make videos about planes and some art. No actual art. This includes reviews on board flights from around the world and detailed tours through aircraft in museums. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. And a massive thanks to the National Museum of the US Air Force in Dayton, Ohio for letting me film this aircraft. I have many other similar guided tour videos on my channel, including the B-2, XB-70, F-22 and JFK's Air Force One. Now let's begin with some history. Theodore Roosevelt actually became the first US president to fly on the 11th of October 1910 on board a Wright Flyer, although at that time he was already out of office. Franklin D. Roosevelt was the first president to fly in office and that was on a modified Douglas Dolphin amphibian designated by the US Navy as the RD-2. It came with a more luxurious interior with room for four passengers and a sleeping compartment. This was used from 1933 until 1939. In 1943, Roosevelt flew to the Casablanca Conference in Morocco on board a Boeing 314 flying boat called Dixie Clipper. Air travel was preferred at the time due to the risk of German submarines in the Atlantic Ocean. This was operated by Pan Am, which meant that they were somewhat reliant on the commercial airlines, so the US Army Air Forces ordered a dedicated, modified, consolidated B-24 Liberator called the C-87A. Named Guess Where 2, Serial 24159 was built and you can see it here in the background, but was actually not accepted by the Secret Service, so used in a secondary transport role. This aircraft had a poor safety record and because of its similarity to the B-24 bomber, it would have created the impression of being an offensive aircraft rather than a VIP transporter. So instead, we have this aircraft, the Douglas VC-54C, which itself was a modified DC-4 airliner. While other presidential aircraft were modified regular planes, this was the first one built from the very start for the president and this is the only VC-54C ever built. It was nicknamed the Sacred Cow because of the high levels of security surrounding every aspect of its assembly, maintenance, flights and storage. It was based on the C-54A's fuselage and fitted with the C-54B wings which had a greater fuel capacity. It was powered by four Pratt & Whitney R2000 14 cylinder 2004 cubic inch engines producing around 1450 horsepower each. These aircraft were designed for practicality rather than comfort, so you had to duck your head entering via the front right door. There were seven crew members in total, and these two positions were for the pilot and the co-pilot. It's a pretty standard DC-4 cockpit, but I'll point out a few things. That circular control on the left is to turn the nose wheel. Obviously, these two are yokes similar to any modern Boeing, and in the center there's a lot more levers than what you might expect than the usual one per engine you'll see on a modern aircraft. These black ones are the throttle controls for the four engines, and they mirror each other so that they're in easy reach of both pilots. The middle four levers are the prop controls. Moving back and behind is the radio operator's position, and this was a busier job than you'd expect, as there was no air traffic control like we see now. A unique feature of this aircraft was the radio telephone so that the POTUS could contact the ground if needed. Behind me, and where the door is, is the position for the navigator that would have had a fold-out table. And looking upwards, we have an astrodome, which is what the navigator could use to identify their position with the sextant by looking at the stars. This reminds me of a saying from old Army and Navy friends. The Army sleep under the stars, the Navy navigate by the stars, and the Air Force rate their hotels by the stars. Well, clearly that's not true, as you've got the Air Force here navigating by the stars, so I'll be sure to tell my friends, but I've gone off topic. Here we have an axe in case the political discussions get heated, and badges to remind you of who to vote for. Here you've got drift signals, which could be dropped to help ascertain the wind's direction prior to landing, as well as the aircraft's drift, which generally helps with the navigation process. And this lamp here is from the navigator's position. 
moving back and we have the crew's quarters with the galley to prepare meals and this included an electric refrigerator which was a rare luxury for that era. And here's bunk beds on the opposite side. Here are extra fuel tanks as the first flight was to Crimea for the Yalta conference in 1945, therefore crossing the Atlantic required the additional fuel. Now every landing is a security threat as well, so avoiding hopping around foreign countries to pick up extra fuel would always be a preference. In fact, with the 1945 Yalta trip, security was such a concern as there was obviously a lot of ill will over the whole European continent and growing suspicion of the Soviets. They changed its serial number in an attempt to hide who was on board. This was potentially now just one of over 1,000 C-54s flying around the world. Here's the fake number, which they've kept for this display. Here's a photo of the proper serial number, albeit partially obscured by the prop. Regular C-54s also came with these cabin fuel tanks, but with the introduction of the C-54B, fuel tanks were installed inside the wings as I mentioned before, so the cabin tanks were removed allowing for more seats or cargo. There's more bunk beds and seats, and looking ahead is the President's Executive Conference Room, which we'll explore in a sec. As well as the seven crew, there was room for 15 passengers, including the President, so his security and support staff were certainly a lot less than later on as their VIP aircraft got a lot larger. And by the way, the Sacred Cow was never official. In fact, it was called the Flying White House, but that name never stuck. We'll have a quick glimpse out of the window, and you'll note that when we spin around, the window behind the president's chair is square, as it's actually bulletproof. Here's an image from the outside. Obviously, weight would have been a problem, so they reserved the special protection for the boss only. The president's chair is in the middle, and behind that were some climate controls and a phone to contact other staff. Behind this panel is actually a toilet as mobility was a problem with his disability, therefore he could easily move into it from his chair. And behind the lounge was a fold-out bed. We'll continue the tour further back to where the President's support staff would have spent most of their time, although we'll get a brief glimpse back into the presidential room with a favourite painting of a ship. Turning around again and we see the aft end of the aircraft, which includes more tables and chairs and you'll notice that there's no bunk beds above them so there's a lot more room and there's another bathroom. What's really interesting is this hole in the floor. They installed a battery powered elevator for President Roosevelt and his wheelchair so that he could easily get on board. This removed the need for special stairs, which would have been a security problem as people would otherwise be able to guess who was about to visit. Sadly, Roosevelt only flew on this once to Yalta, as he died shortly afterwards. Harry Truman used this aircraft all throughout his administration and of significance. On July 26, 1947, he signed the National Security Act of 1947, establishing the US Air Force. And as we step out, we get a brief glance of that bulletproof window. In 1947, this was replaced by a modified C-118 liftmaster called Independence after Truman's Missouri hometown. And here's that very aircraft you see now. Eisenhower introduced Constellations with Columbine 3 here, and that was followed by the Jet Age with the VC-137, both of whom I tour through in my channel. The Sacred Cow was used in a secondary VIP transporter role until it was officially retired in October 1961. In 1983, it was transported to this museum and restored via 34,000 hours of work and now appearing as it did at President Roosevelt's trip to Yalta, hence the fictitious serial number. I should also mention that this aircraft was never called Air Force One. In 1953, an Eastern Airlines Flight 8610 crossed paths with Air Force 8610, which was carrying Eisenhower. They then realised the potential safety and security problem with these names, so then they started informally using the Air Force One name before officially changing the designation in 1962. So technically this was not the first Air Force One, but you can understand what I mean since the Air Force One moniker has become synonymous with the President's dedicated aircraft. You'll notice in this photo that it has a number of flags for the countries she has visited. It's a nice touch, but otherwise the exterior was kept fairly plain. Keen listeners will have noticed that I mentioned Roosevelt only flew on this once, and that was to the Yalta Conference. 
He was known as a nervous flyer, and because the waters were now safer, he returned to the USA on board the heavy cruiser USS Quincy. By the way, I should mention the base aircraft in more detail, the Douglas DC-4 and the military version, the C-54. Over 1,200 of these two were built, with the majority being the military version due to World War II. It was a replacement for the DC-3 and came with four engines, allowing it to carry considerably more people and or cargo. It first flew in 1942 and came with a more modern tricycle landing gear layout and was designed to have a pressurised cabin, but no one seemed to order that option, hence the Connie became the first widely used pressurised airliner. While the Boeing 307 was the first pressurised airliner and flown in 1938, but barely any of those sold. Interestingly, there was a modified version of this fitted with British Rolls-Royce Merlin V12 engines, built in Canada as a Canadair North Star, which was considerably faster. It was reliable, but much louder, which became more and more of an issue in the post-war period where people expected a far more comfortable way to fly. If you enjoyed this video, please click the thumbs up so that I know to keep making them and check out my channel for many more similar videos from this museum and others around the world. Thanks for watching.